another way to think about food is that food contains energy, that energy generally in the form of macronutrients. It's important for us to understand how much energy is in a particular food. Overconsumption of energy can result in obesity and associated health conditions such as diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and liver disease. These are major public health issues in our population. On the other hand, if you don't have enough energy, it can stunt your growth or can not provide you with enough energy to efficiently accomplish your normal tasks, including the normal physiology of your body. In this unit, we're gonna talk about the relationships between food and energy. To describe the various components that relate to energy intake, I'll tell you something about Atwater factors and how these can be used to connect macronutrient levels to the amount of energy in a particular food. Finally, we're gonna describe the difference between weight gain and weight loss and relate those to the concept of energy balance. So there are two main reasons why we have to eat. One is to provide our bodies with the essential nutrients, the things we can't make ourselves, vitamins, minerals, essential amino acids, and essential fats. But the second role is to provide energy, generally in the form of macronutrients. This is to maintain bodily functions and to allow us the energy to accomplish our daily tasks. So how much energy do we actually need? It varies depending on our energy expenditure. Our energy expenditure depends on our physical activity and our rate of metabolism. The USDA guidance is that males should consume 2,500 kilocalories per day to maintain energy balance. That means that the estimated metabolic rate for men is 2,500 kilocalories. For women, the recommendation is 2,000 kilocalories per day. So what do we need this energy for? It might surprise you to learn that the majority of our energy is actually used with our basal metabolic rate. These are normal processes. You can think of this as your breathing or your heart beating. These are things that have to happen no matter what. They're not even things that you're thinking about doing, but they're very important and they consume a lot of energy. The second component is physical activity. And this again is broken down into something that might seem obvious, which is exercise, maybe the run that you went on this morning, and your normal activity. For example, the amount of energy it took for you to get up and walk around your apartment. The fourth component is something called the thermic effect of food. And that's the energy that it actually takes to digest, absorb, and transport our food. We'll talk a little bit more about this in a minute. So what does it mean to be in energy balance? It means that when our energy intake perfectly matches our energy expenditure over time, we will neither gain or lose weight. That means we'll be in energy balance. If you're following the USDA guidelines and your energy intake is 2,000 kilocalories per day, and your energy expenditure is also 2,000 kilocalories per day, over time, your body weight should not change. However, if your energy expenditure decreases, maybe you become less physically active or your basal metabolic rate changes, or your energy intake increases, for example, maybe more calories are consumed, you're in a state of what's called positive energy balance, where your energy intake exceeds your energy expenditure. Over time, that will result in weight gain. Conversely, if your energy expenditure increases or your energy intake decreases, now your energy expenditure exceeds your energy intake and you're in a state called negative energy balance. In that case, over time, you will lose your body weight. Turning back to food, what is a calorie and how is it determined? Well, calories are determined by the energy that are contained in chemical bonds and that are available for our bodies to use. If you look at the structure here of a triglyceride compared to the structure of glucose, there's a lot more energy in a triglyceride, especially in the fatty acids of a triglyceride. If you calculated how much energy is in a triglyceride, you would find that there's nine kilocalories per gram of triglyceride. By contrast, there's only four kilocalories per gram of glucose. These numbers are stable across many triglyceride and carbohydrate classes, and they're known as something called Atwater's rules. These have been defined since the early 1900s, and as you can see, different macronutrients have different kilocalories per gram. Proteins and carbohydrates at four, with lipids at nine. Fiber, which is inefficiently digested by our bodies, has an estimated at water factor of two kilocalories per gram. Whereas alcohol, which you may not even think of as a macronutrient, has seven kilocalories per gram. This is worth remembering because if you drink an alcoholic beverage, there's energy not only in the carbohydrates that might be present or the proteins, but also in the alcohol itself, which can be used by our bodies to generate energy. So let's go through an example. Imagine a woman is only consuming carbohydrates and she's meeting the USDA guidelines for energy expenditure. How much would she need to consume to maintain energy balance?
So the average energy expenditure for a woman is estimated to be 2,000 kilocalories per day. The Atwater factor for carbohydrates is 4 kilocalories per day, which means that if this woman was consuming only carbohydrates, she would need to consume 500 grams of carbohydrates per day to have an energy intake of 2,000 calories. By contrast, for an all-fat diet with an Atwater factor of 9 kilocalories per gram, the woman would only need to consume 222 grams of fat, 2,000 divided by 9. Again, that's because of the higher energy density in triglyceride than there is in carbohydrates. You can use Atwater factors if you know the amount of grams of any macronutrient in a food to calculate the total energy in the food. I mentioned before, some of the energy in our food may not be available. We can only convert energy in some chemical bonds into the energy in our bodies. The first reason could be that we are not able to absorb that macronutrient particularly efficiently. A good example of this is fiber. Our bodies can't digest fiber into a form that can be absorbed by most of our bodies. Therefore, the energy in fiber, even though it's in the chemical bonds, never gets into our bodies and therefore can never be used. Similarly, non-caloric sweeteners such as aspartame or sorbitol have a chemical structure that does not allow them to be absorbed. There's still energy in the bonds of those substances, but we cannot use them. The other example by which the energy might not be available is if that energy is used up during the digestion process. For example, dietary proteins are broken down into peptides and amino acids before their absorption. The process by which those peptides and amino acids are broken down, the process by which those are transported into our gastrointestinal system, the process by which they're transported out of our gastrointestinal system, and the process by which they're absorbed into our target tissues all consume energy. Therefore, in order for us to digest and absorb dietary proteins, a lot of energy is lost or consumed during this digestion and transport process. This energy that is used as we digest food is known as diet-induced thermogenesis. That was the fourth component of energy expenditure we mentioned before. In summary, we need to get energy from our foods. We need it to maintain our normal bodily functions. But consumption of too much energy can result in obesity. Consumption of too little can allow us not enough energy to adequately perform daily tasks. While energy requirements vary from person to person, the recommendations are 2,000 calories per gram for an average woman. 2,500 calories per gram for a man. Atwater's rules are useful because they can tell us how to convert the amount of grams of a particular macronutrient into the amount of energy, with alcohol and fat having the highest energy per gram and fiber having the lowest. Finally, the amount of energy that is usable in a food depends on both the type of the macronutrient and how efficiently it's absorbed by our bodies, and this can vary from person to person.